This is from John 16. Jesus said, now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to God. God. Thank you. strength and our Redeemer. Well, today is Pentecost, and instead of just celebrating something that happened in the church 2,000 years ago, today I want us to think about what does Pentecost mean for me? What does it mean for my life? Is it really that important for me personally? The account of the entrance of the Holy Spirit into the lives of the disciples and therefore into the life of the church is so dramatic, as we just read, so life-changing, it sometimes causes us to stand back with awe and wonder, maybe even fear. I mean, it's a nice thing to observe, we think, but we're not sure we would even really want something like that to happen in our lives. I mean, what we read about, wild rushing winds, flames of tongues, landing on our shoulders. We might think, I'm glad it happened, but I really don't want it to happen to me. We have a tendency, I think, sometimes to relegate the Holy Spirit to the fringe areas of our lives. And whenever we read the words Spirit-filled, we might start to get a little bit uncomfortable. We're comfortable talking about God the Father, we're comfortable talking about Jesus the Son, but the third member of the Godhead to many of us is like the Cousin Eddie of the Trinity. You just don't know what to do with Him. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about that aspect of our spiritual experience that unsettles people sometimes. And we, we, we've not really 
taken the history of the early church and of Christianity as a whole seriously until we acknowledge the role of the Holy Spirit in everything that happened. The same Holy Spirit that makes things happen in the book of Acts, as we read it, is the same Holy Spirit that's alive and ready to upend our existence right here, right now, even this morning, in this place. So let me repeat this. You cannot, you cannot be a follower of Jesus unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit. That truth is clearly taught throughout the New Testament. We read that earlier today. We're all baptized in one Spirit. We all share one Spirit. If you try to follow Jesus without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and that's exactly what Jesus promised His followers, as he was getting ready to leave the earth, he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and so if you, if you try to do the Christian life without the Holy Spirit, sooner or later, you will reach a point where you're frustrated by your failures. You keep doing what you don't want to do, and you can't do the things or aren't able to do the things you really do want to do. You may keep promising people uh, that, that you're going to change. You may keep promising people around you that you've hurt by your action that things are going to be different this time. And this time you really mean it. Of course, every time you really mean it. But the change rarely lasts more than a few days. You may lie awake at night sometimes because of something you've done. Maybe saying to yourself, never again, never again will I do this. Never again will I lose my temper. Never again will I go to that particular website. Never again will I do this or will I do that. Whatever it is in your life that the writer of Hebrews describes as the sin that so easily besets us. But you know, soon, you're lying awake making the same promises. It just doesn't work. Because when we try to follow Jesus without the influence and power of the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves frustrated by our failures and exhausted by our efforts. It's like we're trying to play the role of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. But you know, trying to be a God has a tendency to wear you out. It will leave you tired and frustrated. And you can think, I can do this on my own. Or you think the Christian life is about trying harder. And so I've said this before. So you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, you grit your teeth, and you go, today I'm going to love everybody. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. When we try to follow Jesus without being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, we become overwhelmed by life's circumstances. I mean, this has happened to all of us. This has happened to me. Times when I'm not depending on the Holy Spirit. Some Christians, we, we, we begin to follow Christ just fine because everything's going well. But then when something happens in our life, something goes wrong, we don't have the power to overcome it. Instead, we go away. Instead of following close to Christ, sticking close to Him in the storm, we have a tendency to get discouraged. And we keep our distance. When life is smooth, everything in our Christian walk seems okay. But eventually, something happens that we can't get through on our own. This life, this Christian life, does not work without the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus declares to His disciples, what does He say? We talked about this last week. They're to wait in Jerusalem that they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that power comes on them and that presence comes on them, it will cause them to be bold witnesses, Jesus said, throughout the entire earth. He says that's going to happen, and then He leaves. He leaves them behind. They're uneducated. They don't have any resources. They have no strategic plan. They have no special power or influence. How can they follow Him if He isn't there to lead them? And sometimes, 
we may try to live our lives the way the disciples did before Pentecost, which we looked at last week. We may try our best to follow Jesus in our own strength and our own power, but that's not how Jesus intended life to be. Sometimes when we read through the Gospels, read the stories of the disciples following Jesus, and we can't help but be a little bit envious. You know, we think, what would it have been like to follow Jesus in person? I mean, maybe we're glad for the Holy Spirit, but we tend to think of Him as being a part of the junior varsity team of the Trinity. (laughs) But that's not how Jesus portrayed the Holy Spirit to His followers. In John chapter 16, we read one of the last conversations that Jesus would have with His disciples before His arrest and His crucifixion. And He's trying to prepare them for His death. But they're in denial. They can't imagine losing Jesus as their leader, losing Jesus as their teacher, losing Jesus as their friend. It's the worst possible news. But listen to what Jesus says to them. Let this sink in. In fact, we use this in our call to worship this morning. Jesus said this, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor, the Comforter, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. Did you catch that? Jesus, God in the flesh, says it's better for Him to leave Because when He goes, the Holy Spirit will come. It's better. Why would He say that? Well, because something changed after the death and resurrection of Jesus. We have a new relationship with God. In fact, there's a subtle but critical prepositional change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the phrase is God with us. But in the New Testament, it's God in us. Jesus says, it's better for you if I go because while God with you is good, God in you is better. See, Jesus could be with His followers, but the Holy Spirit would live in His followers. And that's better. Much better. Jesus said it was better for Him to leave. It was better to send the Holy Spirit. And the question for us this morning is, do we believe Him? And if we do believe Him, do our lives reflect that belief? The Bible tells us that we as Christians have the Spirit of God living inside of us. The same, the very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's powerful. But have we internalized this truth and are we enjoying the blessings that He intended for us to have? See, most of us as Christians, we have a a basic knowledge about the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not some indistinct power or thing or force, the Holy Spirit is God. And as we study the Bible, we have to come to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is not a lesser or a different kind of being than God the Father or God the Son. And although the word Trinity is never used in the Bible, the concept of the Trinity is replete throughout Scripture, because the Scripture over and over says the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. We serve a triune God. One God in three persons. And since the Holy Spirit is God, the Spirit is, just like God, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. That means omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows everything. And omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Present. And we have that knowledge, but what about our experience in daily lives? So take just a moment and ask yourself this question. When was the last time 
I undeniably saw the Spirit of God at work in me or around me. Something you absolutely knew was a work of God. And if, yeah, and if you can think of something fairly recent, thank you for your testimony. Thank God for His active presence in your life. And if you're having trouble remembering such a moment, maybe it's because you just haven't given it much thought. Or you aren't actively looking for His presence and His activity with sensitive spiritual eyes. Because He's at work all around us. That's what Jesus said. All throughout Scripture, and especially in the book of Acts, we read of the apostles whose lives were led by the Holy Spirit and lived out by His power. And it began on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus' followers and a new age began. And just as we read, Peter steps up to the plate and he begins to proclaim boldly what those gathered together that day had just witnessed. And it said, if you remember, that as he preached, as he told them the truth about Jesus, that the audience is cut to the heart it says, by Peter's words, and they cry out, what should we do? And Peter replies, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And most of us have learned that verse, or we think of that verse, and we end it right there. All right, repentance, baptism, forgiveness of sins, in the name of Jesus, period. End of story. But that isn't the end of the pronouncement or the promise. And many times we leave off the last phrase. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To live the life that God intends for us to live, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. It's not enough to receive forgiveness of our sins. It's not just about getting a one-way ticket to heaven someday. If you want to live your life for God in this world, you have to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you do receive that gift when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You just may not have been aware of that. The physical presence of the historical person Jesus is gone from this earth. And if you remember, as you read the Gospel stories, even when He was here, the disciples often had no power to live out their faith. In fact, remembering, Jesus was often frustrated with their lack of understanding, their lack of follow-through on what He was teaching them. But something better was coming. The Holy Spirit. And notice the following verse of Jesus' message that we just read on that Pentecost Sunday. It was the last verse we read. He says this to the crowd. The promise. What promise? The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Do you get that? It wasn't just for them on that very special day when the Holy Spirit first came. It's for all who are far off. That's in distance and in time. It's for you. It's for me. It's for all of us who have come to receive what only Jesus Christ can offer. Repentance. Forgiveness of sins. But perhaps most importantly, the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we try following Jesus Christ in our own power, eventually we will get burned out. If we are depending on our own strength to follow Jesus, we will soon find ourselves drained and defeated. Jesus promised His followers that the Spirit would come upon them in power. And we understand that it's a journey, this Christian life, that we were never supposed to make alone. Instead, as we yield to the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, 
He will supernaturally give us the strength and the power that we need. The, the Spirit of God chooses you and chooses me as His dwelling place. That is not a distant, loose connection. And as I live and I move, the Spirit of the living God is within me, even when I'm not aware of it. I might wake up on a particular day, and this happens to me quite a bit. I'm sure it happens to you. I might be feeling physically tired or stressed or impatient. And humanly speaking, those things would probably define my day. But the reality is, I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And because of this reality, stress and tiredness and impatience don't have to define my day. I can let them. I can choose that way. But with the Holy Spirit, I don't have to. I want to give you a secret. It's not a formula, but a, a challenge. If, if this message has meant anything to you at all, and maybe you think, well, I, I don't know if I've experienced that in my life. Went to a Christian counselor one time, and he told me this. I don't do it every morning. I did for a long time. But he said every morning when I wake up, I put my hand over my heart, and I say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. What a great way to start your day. What a great way of acknowledging His presence in your life, and you're going to look for Him that day and what He's doing all around you and what He wants to do in you. So I challenge you this week, every morning you wake up, put your hand over your heart and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Because the Spirit of God, if you're a believer in Christ, chooses you and me as His dwelling place. That is not a distant, loose connection. As I said, Jesus Christ did not die in order to follow us. He died and rose again so that we could and would follow Him. Not in our own power, but in His power. Through the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. So Pentecost, today. One day, as somebody already said, this has always bothered me. I didn't grow up in a, a liturgical lectionary church. We have Pentecost one day, and next Sunday it'll be green. You know what we call that? Ordinary time. I'm sorry, if you read the book of Acts, after the Holy Spirit came, nothing was ordinary ever again. But we don't have to live our lives in an ordinary way because God is at work all around us, inviting you and me to become a part of what He's doing. And we can do it in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. You can choose, as I said, we can still choose to just be ordinary. Or we can choose to let God's Spirit empower and embolden and flow through us to participate in the extraordinary things that God is still doing every single day. Let's pray. Father, on this Pentecost Sunday, we thank You for the gift of Your Holy Spirit. Who, as we put our faith and trust in Christ, comes to live within us. That's the promise of Your Word. Even when we don't feel it, Lord, even when we're not sensing it, we trust Your Word. Your Word is true. And we don't live our lives by our feelings. We live our, word, our, our lives by Your truth. And we can get in touch with the Holy Spirit if we just spend the time. And if we will take the time every day to reflect and focus Put our hands on our hearts and say, Holy Spirit, You are welcome here. And I pray those of those that are here this morning that will take that to heart, that You will show them this week how You hear their cry, You hear their plea, You hear their desire, and You will show them and come to them in a way that they will know and sense Your presence and Your power in their lives. In Jesus' name, Amen.